I'm Jim Lehrer. On November 3rd, join Robert McNeil and me for a NewsHour election night special with full analysis of the returns and live reports from campaign headquarters. The following night, November 4th, we'll be back with a special 90-minute look at the next four years, asking the simple question, now what? Join us for these important public events here on public television. This is Iowa Public Television. Portions of our broadcast day are made possible by grants from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and Friends of Iowa Public Television. Stay tuned for more TV worth watching right here on Iowa Public Television, a resource for Iowa's future. Because of the length of David Frost's interviews with the major presidential candidates, the Mark Russell special scheduled for this time will be seen at 11. The Nightly Business Report is next. Acquisition of this program is made possible by Friends of Iowa Public Television. And this broadcast of the Nightly Business Report is brought to you locally by the full-service investment firm of Piper Jaffrey and its employees. With offices in Des Moines, Quad Cities, Waterloo, Sioux City, Mason City, and Storm Lake. Good evening. I'm Cassie Seifert in New York. Coming up on NBR, hopes for a recovery in the housing market remain strong despite a dip in new home sales. Paul Kangas is on assignment. I'm Scott Gervey in Miami. Today, the Dow drops as concerns about the presidential election keep traders anxious. NBR is made possible by Digital Equipment Corporation, leveraging investments in information systems for today and tomorrow. People come to us for results. The $63 billion Franklin Group of Funds, helping 2 million investors reach their goals since 1947. Franklin funds are distributed nationwide by investment professionals. A.G. Edwards, member of the New York Stock Exchange, serving the investment needs of individuals and businesses through more than 400 offices nationwide. And is produced in association with Reuters, the world's largest electronic publisher, which provides NBR with news, market data, and communication services worldwide. Sales of new homes fell in September for the first time in five months. The government says sales declined 1%, but remained well ahead of the same period last year. And some analysts say today's report is consistent with gradual improvement in the housing market. Rodney Ward reports. New home sales rose in the Northeast and the South, but they weren't enough to offset declines in the Midwest and West. In the Northeast, sales increased 25.3% in September, but plunged 14.4% in the Midwest. The Commerce Department also offered a brighter picture of August home sales. The revised figure showed sales increased by 1.6%, rather than declining by 6% as previously reported. With the revision to August, which is a big, big development, and then this preliminary number suggests that the single family market is, uh, is holding together at a level significantly above the second quarter of the year. Overall, sales for the first nine months of 1992 were up 20%, compared with the same period last year, the worst years for home builders since World War II. And while the lowest mortgage rates since 1973 failed to provide a major boost for sales during September, the lower rates are helping to increase home buyer interest. They realize that their biggest chance to get into the uh, situation of advanced equity is to own a home and they're coming out to buy houses and they realize that this may be the best time. But continuing concern over the overall state of the economy and uncertainty about the future has kept some home buyers on the sidelines despite the lower interest rates. Given what we, we believe about the underlying demographics, population growth, household, potential household growth and so forth, combined with what I think is a backlog of buyers that will be moving in when the, when the time is right, uh, we're expecting 93, 94 to stack up as pretty good single-family housing years, probably rivaling uh, some of the good years of the 1980s. But before the return to the heady days of the 1980s, the home builders expect to see only gradual increases in new home sales through the remainder of the year. Rodney Ward, NBR, Washington. The stock market does not like question marks, and it got several of those today. 
It was a quiet opening, but the Dow headed down as soon as the last pre-election economic reports came out. As you saw, the home sales report was confusing at best, and then the Chicago Purchasing Managers Index showed a sharp drop for October. With that, the Dow fell to a nearly 20-point loss, traders also facing the uncertainty of a very close presidential election. They had pretty much assumed a Clinton victory before the most recent polls. There was a little end-of-the-day rally, but it did not hold, and the Dow went on to close at 32.26.28, down 1999. But for the week, the Dow rose 18.64, and for the month of October, the Dow fell 45.38, or 1.4 percent. So today, it closed over 24 and a quarter points below the best level and about two points above the worst level. Trading volume today, 196.7 million shares, down 9.6 million shares from yesterday's pace, down volume exceeding up volume by 19 million shares. The Dow Transport Index fell nine and a quarter points. Utility moved up 0.44. The closing tick came in at a moderately bullish, plus 435. The Standard Poor's 500 lost 2.18. The 100 fell nearly two and a half. The mid-cap 400 ended off 0 0.05, and the Commodity Research Bureau December Index rose 0.55. The New York Stock Exchange Index fell 0.85, the value line was up 0 0.02, and the broadly-based Wilshire 5000 dropped 13 points. The bond market retreated today, driving interest rates up, traders apparently concluding that weaker-than-expected economic activity now means more government stimulus. The Treasury market is also preparing for next week's announcement of the government's quarterly refunding needs. Corporates were also weak today in slow trading. The Bellwether 30-year Treasury closed down 17.30 seconds. The Sherson Lehman Long Treasury Bond Index fell 8.54, and Fed funds ended the day at 3 and 1 16th percent. I'll be back a little later to show you where the action was on Wall Street today. Cassie? The dollar settled mostly higher in quiet trading. Analysts say the greenback has shown surprising resilience in the face of two negative economic reports. The dollar rose almost half a fennig against the mark, gained about a fifth of a yen against the Japanese currency, and rose more than one and two-thirds cents against the pound. On the campaign trail today, George Bush and Bill Clinton were running hard as polls showed the battle tightening going into this last weekend of the race. The president campaigned at a convention of Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise owners in Nashville. He said Clinton's economic plan will lead to a bloated federal bureaucracy and put a regulatory stranglehold on small business. He coined a new phrase for the Democrats' proposals. You might call this old-fashioned idea trample down economics. Tramples down business with these deadly new mandates and regulations tramples down individual initiative with higher taxes and tramples down the dreams of people with the power of that bureaucracy, the power of bureaucrats. But Clinton was punching back at the president's economic record, saying it was Mr. Bush who presided over the biggest increase in government spending and regulation in 20 years. Clinton said much of the recent spurt in growth came from arms sales, which he said Mr. Bush gave away when he got behind in the polls. And he lashed back at the president for calling Democratic ideas crazy. I'll tell you what I think is crazy. I think crazy is unemployment going up and incomes going down. It's 100,000 Americans a month losing their health insurance. It's one in 10 Americans on food stamps. It's America going from first to 13th in the world in wages under trickle-down economics. In an interview to be broadcast on PBS tonight, Clinton tells David Frost that financial markets should not fear a Democratic victory. He says he's worked hard to send a clear signal that he will operate with discipline, and he has tried to convey to people who influence the markets that, quote, you don't have to go haywire if a Democrat wins. The issue of water trickled down the campaign trail today. California Governor Pete Wilson flew to Tennessee to meet with President Bush, hoping to convince him to veto a sweeping water bill. The legislation includes reclamation projects in 17 western states, but would also hurt California farmers. And that's created a political minefield in this election year. Motor correspondent John Defterios reports. Farmers refer to the Central Valley as the Garden of Eden. Once a desert, the region now produces a third of the state's $18 billion in farm receipts each year with the help of federally subsidized water. But one part of the bill now on the president's desk would limit the access to that supply. It would create a precedent that not it, today it's going to be Central Valley Project, 
uh, tomorrow it could be Central Utah Project. Even though farm groups say up to 10,000 jobs would be lost if the federal act is signed, they admit it is an uphill fight against other interests. The bill has a broad-based coalition. Environmental groups support the legislation because about one-third of the water will be set aside for fish and wildlife preservation. And water agencies and California business groups like the bill because more water will be made available to consumers and industry. So it's tremendous benefit to growing urban areas who have no source of new water on the horizon the bill is testing the cloud of California agribusiness, which analysts say has given the Republican Party over a million dollars this election cycle. When visiting the Central Valley in May, the president vowed to veto anything that threatened farmers. Now he is getting heat from Republican senators who represent key electoral states where the bill would provide new dams. He stands to lose something either way, and uh, it's hard for him to come out a hero because, after all, he didn't support the legislation in the first place. Even though the president is sympathetic to farmers, a White House official said advisors are still split on what should happen to Central Valley water. John Defterius of Reuters for NBR. Federal officials say they are investigating whether the treasurer of the United States illegally accepted gifts from her former employer. Catalina Vasquez Villapando's signature appears on all U.S. currency. She has held several posts during the Reagan and Bush administrations and addressed the Republican National Convention in August. During the 80s, the Georgia company where she once worked received a number of government contracts. Villapando has been granted a leave of absence. And still ahead in our program, the feathers are flying in the battle to become the king of quick chicken. Meyer's Squibb announced today that it will lay off 2,200 people, about 6% of its workforce, early next year. The pharmaceutical company blames efforts to contain health care costs and marketing restrictions on its products. Earlier this week, Bristol Meyer said it's selling its household products business to Johnson Wax for more than a billion dollars. But Scott, some analysts say the actions may not be enough to offset the difficulties facing the drug industry right now. And Cassie Bristol-Myers stock today closed at 68, up three quarters. The Dow Jones, meanwhile, ended the day with a loss of about 20 points at 3226.28. There were 21 more issues down than up. 57 new highs for the year, 37 new lows. Topping the big board active list and trading 3.6 million shares, CMAQ Investment, this was a new issue. It rose 1 point, 9.6 million shares came out at $18 a share. Glaxo Holdings fell a half, Telmex gained 5 eighths. National Semiconductor lost 1 and 3 quarters. Montgomery Securities reportedly downgraded the stock to hold from a buy. Merck rose a half. Advanced Micro Devices moved up 5 eighths. IBM rose 7 eighths. Triton Energy fell another two points. Yesterday it dropped 4 and an eighth. This is on disappointment over the size of that oil find uh, in Colombia. A 1 and, eight, uh, 1 and 3 eighths point drop in Philip Morris. GM slipping 5 eighths. Among widely held issues, AMR fell a point. Chevron lost two points. The news today is that Pennzoil completed the exchange of its 48% stake in Chevron for all of Chevron's PBC unit. J.C. Penney tumbled uh, two and a half. Kellogg gained one and a quarter. Bear Stearns repeated a buy. McDonnell Douglas ended off a point. Texaco lost one and three-eighths. Its Canadian unit reported a loss in the third quarter, but it says higher natural gas prices will boost the company's earnings throughout 1993. Among the big movers, Craig Corporation moved up 7 eighths. Talks to sell its 50 cent, uh, 50 percent stake in Statter Brothers to Reading Corporation are about to begin. Sun Company rising one and a half. News Corporation Limited also gained one and a half. The Australian media company hit a new high for the year. There was no uh, news today, but uh, first quarter earnings are due out in the next couple of weeks. Big loser of the day, IMO Industries falling one and seven eighths after the close yesterday. It reported a loss of three dollars and forty one cents. That's against earnings of thirteen cents. The company says it has suspended its dividend. Also intends to sell a twenty percent stake uh, in its assets as part of a restructuring plan. Cabot Corporation dropped two points. Payne Weber cut estimates today. Atlanta Gas fell one and five eighths. Smith Barney downgraded the stock. In NASDAQ trading, a drop of 0.65 in the NASDAQ composite. For the week, it rose 7.87 or 1.3%. 
for the month, up nearly 22 points. Volume today much lower, 21 and a quarter million shares behind yesterday's pace. 155 more stocks up than down. The 100 index gave up nearly four points. Topping the NASDAQ most active list, Intel up a point, Microsoft dropping one and a quarter, Sun Micro slipping an eighth, SWIP Holdings rising three eighths, Apple Computer falling that much, a one point drop in Novell, Legion down three quarters, Cisco losing a point, Telecommunications Class A falling three eighths, U.S. Healthcare rising three eighths. Among the big movers, Corvell Corporation gaining two and three eighths, Dane Bosworth analyst repeated a buy. Siriflex Health losing three points, reporting lower than expected third quarter earnings, and quarter deck dropping one and a quarter lower third, uh, fourth quarter earnings of seven cents versus 6.16. Over on the American Exchange, a gain of 0.43 in the market value index for the week up seven and a half, but for the month only up five. Trading volume today down 2.2 million shares below yesterday's pace, 278 up, 229 down. Topping the active list on 571,000 shares, IVEX slipping a quarter. Among the big movers, Johnson Products up three and three eighths, fourth quarter earnings $1.38 against 32 cents. And finally, Nantucket Industries gaining one and an eighth. The company didn't return our calls today. And that's the Wall Street wrap up. Cassie? Scott, when it comes to fast food, the burger is still a hard to beat. But more and more consumers are turning to more nutritious foods. That trend has entrepreneurs rushing to fill the gap for healthful fast foods. Karen Ryan reports on some new ideas those entrepreneurs are hatching. Kenny Rogers usually sings about a gambler, but now he's doing the betting. Betting that with his name and ex-Kentucky Fried Chicken owner John Y. Brown's expertise, they can successfully break into the fast food roasted chicken market. What fried food was to the 80s, this is going to be the chicken of the 90s. But Roger's name can only draw the customers into the store. His food has to keep them. Because if it's not good, consumers will be flying the coop to all the other fast food chicken franchises that are springing up. One of those restaurants is Cluckers. Although there are only four stores in South Florida, Cluckers president David Sharps says he's confident enough in his product that he's ready to spread his wings and expand. Over the next two years, he's trying to raise $7 million from a public offering. And I think the people that will survive are the top operators, people that understand how to deliver quality on a consistent basis each and every day. And Wall Street analysts agree that if the new chicken companies are well run, they can operate successfully without ever having to compete directly with the big hamburger chains. 90% 90, 90 of, the, of the publicly held chains are, are regional. Um, and then segmented further by the type of food they serve. So, so they're not competing head to head, really. Uh, they're kind of on their own, minding their own business, so to speak. And uh, so there's room. But restaurants serving white rather than red are starting to have another advantage. According to the National Broiler Council, chicken consumption is pecking away at beef for the first time in 30 years. Restaurant analysts also say these new chicken joints could be getting a boost because they're considered takeout, which is one of the fastest growing segments of the fast food industry. And in a highly competitive business, that could be a feather in a company's cap. Karen Ryan, NBR, Miami. In business briefs, Northwest Airlines says it has drawn down the remaining balance of a $200 million revolving line of credit. The money was part of the original loan agreement that provided funding when Northwest was taken over in 1989. The airline says it wants to demonstrate to the machinist union that it has sufficient cash to negotiate from strength. Shell Oil reports a third quarter profit of $28 million compared to $14 million in losses a year ago. But the company says because of continuing difficulties in the oil industry, it now expects to cut its workforce by 20% instead of the 10 to 15% it had projected. Shell stock fell one point to 82 and 5 eighths. Coming up, tonight's Market Monitor. George Musia, Director of Research at InvestNet Group. Italian financier Giancarlo Peretti is suing the French bank that helped him buy MGM Studios two years ago. Peretti claims Credit Lyonnais pushed MGM to the brink of bankruptcy in order to take control of the company. The suit filed in Italy seeks nearly $350 million in damages. The bank won control of the studio in February after accusing Peretti of mismanagement and breach of contract. A spokesman today called Peretti's suit without merit. There will be something new at the pumps in 39 metropolitan areas beginning this Sunday. Under the two-year-old Clean Air Act, drivers must begin using a new gasoline that contains a special oxygen additive during certain months of the year. The additive helps the gasoline burn cleaner, cutting down on carbon monoxide.
the gas is required in areas which have failed to meet federal health standards for carbon monoxide. The gas will cost about a nickel more a gallon. Mortgage rates took a slight dip this past week. According to the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, the average 30-year fixed loan rate was 8.21 percent, down from 8.23 percent last week. Adjustable rates also fell this week to 5.12 percent from 5.13. Our guest market monitor this week is George Muzia, the director of research of CDA InvestNet. Its office is located in Fort Lauderdale. We thank you for coming into the nightly business report tonight. Now, George, you basically follow insiders to give you the clues as to which way the market's going. And last time you were here, about a year and a half ago, you said interest rate sensitive stocks was the place to be. You were certainly right on that one. What are the insiders telling you now? Well, right now they're saying don't focus on individual sectors and, and stay away from market momentum. Focus on individual stocks. Uh, what we try to do at InvestNet is to look at clusters of insider buyers versus clusters of insider sellers. A cluster would be three or more different insiders buying in one particular company, for example. And so basically uh, what we're seeing now with our clusters is that it's telling us that one should look at individual stocks and not look at the overall market. Um, now, we have a graphic made up to help us out a little bit with that. What exactly do the statistics tell us now? Well, as you can see back in October of 1990, a good time to be buying stocks. Uh, the clusters were 98% uh, bullish clusters. And then in February of 91, they turned bearish with 83% on the sell side. December of 91, again, with, uh, with the market lower, the clusters were bullish. And then, of course, in February of this past year, we turned bearish because our sell clusters did. Right now, the clusters are a little bit neutral, maybe on the bearish side of neutral. But we don't have all the data, and the market dropped dramatically in October. Um, and um, so consequently, we haven't uh, got the filings in yet. The, the deadline for insider filings is the 5th, uh, 10th of the month. So by December 10th, we will get all of the activity in October. How so we're very, very cautious right now. How difficult is that delay? for you? I mean, you think certainly if you knew what the insiders were doing the minute they were doing it, you'd have a lot better information. It's, uh, it's we would prefer having the filings some more, uh, more available to us, but, uh, but uh, the laws rec do allow them time to get the filings in. They have until a tenth of the month following their activity. So consequently, uh, it, it, since they have to hold for six months, it's a six month holding period from the time they buy before they can sell, or if they sell, they can't buy, buy it back for six months. So consequently, it's not really that critical. Is this kind of uh, lack of direction in the indicators an explanation for why the market has been kind of backing and filling I, I here? I think so, because the, uh, our, we do a lot of work with industries as well, and our industries are relatively neutral. Half of the industries have insider buying, and half of them have insider selling, just as the, uh, as the cluster program. We're very concerned that if the insiders did not buy into this uh, break in the market here, 150 point break in the market in October, we're very concerned that we could have a very, very bad year for the market next year. But we'll know more in a little bit of time. In the meanwhile, uh, one, we're, we're seeing a lot of insider buying in the secondary and tertiary companies as witnessed on the American and the over-the-counter market. So one might want to focus their attention on the smaller companies. All right, name some names. What, uh, what do you have? On the us? New York Stock Exchange, Belding Hemingway and Hook Super X. On the American, Greyhound and Thermetics. And in the over-the-counter market, Southwall Technologies and Televit. Are these stocks that have been depressed in general? These are or? depressed stocks, and this is a good time to be buying depressed stocks because uh, this is the time when tax loss selling will, will, will really take hold. Uh, right, the period between November 15 and December 15 is an awfully good time to be buying stocks because of the tax loss selling pressure. And then, of course, the January effect takes over the following January and February because people who have, who have sold the stock uh, and if a tax loss, will be buying them back. So these are the types of stocks that are depressed and have insider buying. I was going to say, and the insiders are buying them, and that's the big tip off. We wouldn't be interested if they weren't. All right. We will be back to uh, check up and see how you do. We've been speaking with George Musia, Director of Research, CDA InvestNet.
In tonight's commentary, Charles Schultz, senior fellow of the Economic Studies Program at the Brookings Institution, says when it comes to fighting the deficit, a two-pronged approach is better than one. Whoever is president next year may face substantial pressure to forget about deficit reduction and to stimulate the economy with immediate tax cuts and spending increases. If the resulting increase in the budget deficit were only temporary, that wouldn't be a problem. But mere promises by the president and the Congress to keep the stimulus temporary and to cut the budget deficit in future years wouldn't be fully credible. Financial markets would project the higher deficits into the future, and the fear of that result would push up long-term interest rates immediately, thereby reducing the effectiveness of budgetary stimulus. Indeed, some tightening of long-term rates has already been occurring. If early next year it looks as if special measures are needed to spur recovery, the best medicine would be a two-part program. First, an immediate economic stimulus, including a sizable investment tax credit. And second, the simultaneous enactment into law of a set of tax increases and cuts in entitlement programs, but with delayed effective dates, so that these deficit-reducing measures wouldn't be a drag on short-term economic recovery. With long-term deficit reduction firmly enacted into law, the financial markets would have good reason to believe that the immediate deficit increases would subsequently be reversed. Recovery would be speeded up and long-term growth enhanced. This is Charles Schultz. And that's this edition of NBR for Friday, October 30th. I'm Scott Gervey in Miami. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you in uh, New York on Monday, Cassie. Have a good weekend. Great. See you then, Scott. I'm Cassie Seifert in New York. Good night. NBR is produced in association with Reuters, the world's largest electronic publisher, which provides NBR with news, market data, and communication services worldwide. And is made possible by... A.G. Edwards, providing personalized financial services and investment advice to individuals and businesses. A.G. Edwards, a century-old tradition of service to investors. The Franklin Group's 68 mutual funds include tax-free municipal securities funds, U.S. government securities funds, capital growth funds, and money market funds. Digital Equipment Corporation, Leveraging investments in information systems for today and tomorrow. People come to us for results. And by the financial support of viewers like you. NBR has a videotape for anyone who's thinking about investing in stocks. It's How Wall Street Works, winner of the American Film and Video Festival's Blue Ribbon Award. To order by credit card, call 1-800-535-5864. Acquisition of this program is made possible by Friends of Iowa Public Television. And this broadcast of the Nightly Business Report is brought to you locally by the full-service investment firm of Piper Jaffrey and its employees. With offices in Des Moines, Quad Cities, Waterloo, Sioux City, Mason City, and Storm Lake. The long-running war over the Equal Rights Amendment moves its battleground to Iowa on Election Day 1992, and we'll get both sides of the story with activist Phyllis Schlafly, and Eleanor Smeal on this week's edition of Iowa Press. That's Sunday at noon and at 7 here on Iowa Public Television. The Iowa race for the Senate nears the finish line with the final strides run in a debate between Gene Lloyd-Jones and Charles Grassley. Iowa Public Television brings you live coverage of the debate sponsored by the Greater Des Moines Chamber of Commerce Federation. Watch the Senate Candidates Debate Monday live at 12.30 and again at 8 the same evening. Then at 10.30, watch the speeches delivered to the chamber audience by alternative party candidates in the Senate Race Alternative Views.
I'm Jim Lehrer. On November 3rd, join Robert McNeil and me for a NewsHour election night special with full analysis of the returns and live reports from campaign headquarters. The following night, November 4th, we'll be back with a special 90-minute look at the next four years, asking the simple question, now what? Join us for these important public events here on public television. In a time when issues and events demand our attention and understanding, there is a place, every night, every week, that makes a difference in our lives. Where we come to know ourselves and our world. This is Iowa Public Television, a resource for Iowa's future. You're viewing Iowa Public Television, a resource for Iowa's future. Tonight's programming has been delayed, and Doctor Who will be seen one half hour later than scheduled. Stay tuned for political satire from Mark Russell. Then visit the planet of the Daleks at 1130.